Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 3 o'clock edition of the Stafford County Board of Supervisors. Clerk, will you call the roll? Ms. Baumke, here. Mr. Cavalier, here. Mr. Milday, Ms. Sellers, here. Mr. Snellings, here. Mr. Sterling, Mr. Thomas, here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. We'll now go to presentations by the public. I do have one speaker card. I would ask when you come to the podium that you have three minutes to speak on any subject that you would like to speak on. Please state your name and address. When the red light comes on at the end, it's time to wrap up your remarks. I have one speaker card, Mr. Jeffrey Trigger. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Trigger and I live at 518 Clint Lane. I'm here today to ask the board to approve the budget given to you by the school board. Our new budget took into account the county's budget constraints while looking at comparative counties. The budget was also pieced together by the Office of Personnel, the superintendent, and educators. Our budget requests, while not perfect, are a step in the right direction for the future of Stafford County Public Schools. We have to look at the facts. Stafford County ranks 85th out of 132 when it comes to per pupil expenditure in the Commonwealth of Virginia. This is compounded by the fact that Virginia is 41st out of 50 in per pupil expenditure for the country. The ninth wealthiest county and the ninth wealthiest state can do better than we're currently doing. This is not putting kids first. Another concern as an educator is teacher turnover. Zero to five year teachers in this county are leaving at a rate higher than the national average. Our salaries for zero to five year teachers ranks ninth out of nine in the comparative counties. Compounding this problem is the ability to attract new teachers. According to the Office of Personnel, in 2009 we hired one out of every 13 applicants. In 2013 we hired one out of every seven. Not working to retain teachers as well as not working to make the salary scale more attractive to prospective applicants will have disastrous effects on the county. This is not putting kids first. Next is the issue with educational infrastructure. 90% of students at one high school report sitting in a desk held together by duct tape at some point in time during the day. Other schools report having to deal with classrooms that are either way too cold or way too hot. Other schools showing their age complain of leaks and drafty windows. Several of our school buses have been on the road for well over a decade. This is not putting kids first. I am fully aware that the budget set before you does not fix all the problems stated. Dr. Benson has laid forth a plan that will work to address all of these issues over a period of time. However, not stepping up and saying maybe next year is no longer the answer. We need to finance programs to help struggling children learn the material and programs for our higher thinkers to expand their horizons. Let's keep our teachers and recruit highly qualified applicants to replace those who do leave. Let's work to keep our environments great places to learn. And most importantly, let's put kids first. Thank you, Mr. Trigger. That's the only speaker card I have. I'll go to the right side of the room. Anyone on my right like to address the board? Anyone on my left? Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Dean Federoff, 30 Cooks and Drive. You've heard me say this many times. Education is an economic incentive, not a liability. Curbstone revenue estimates and blind political ideology continue to ignore prioritized school needs. This board believes plastic grass is more important than classrooms. The renovation costs of our overcrowded high schools came in at a million dollars over budget. Yet, the school board may not have the funds because they spend $850,000 on a plastic grass field proffer that you negotiated with a developer. As the 10th largest district in Virginia, our total per pupil expenditure ranks 85th out of 132. And your per pupil local contribution is 22% below the state average. The county's budget model is flawed. The county predicts a 2% annual growth rate over the next 25 years. Just released estimates from the UVA Weldon Cooper Center, the state's official statisticians estimate Stafford's growth at 5% per year. When will developers pay their fair share to recover the impact on schools, public safety, and transportation? Using your proffer guidelines to 3,000 homes in the proposed George Washington Village will have a $107 million infrastructure impact on schools and increase the annual operating expense by $15 million. In reality, as it is proposed, 
and it changes every time you open your blink, nearly all of it is unfunded liabilities. Need some more examples? Just look at tomorrow's Planning Commission developer giveaway agenda of the decade. Finding savings is a good thing, but $100,000 was wasted on a grossly inaccurate evergreen efficiency study. Tell me, how will reducing teacher planning time save $27.4 million? Teachers are paid on a school year contract, not a contact hourly wage job. We're, not, we're building mines. We're not changing spark plugs. They will still be there for meetings, professional development, mandated lesson planning, preparing for tests. Oh, and of course, you know, maybe they'd like to eat lunch too. Here's another example. We have one Commonwealth Governor's School, not six. So why don't you follow the evergreen model? Simply multiply the school budget by six, cut it in half, and claim you had a savings. The evergreen uh, did get the climate survey correct. School board members have failed to lead, and dissatisfaction abounds. When I'm elected to next school board representative from Rock Hill, I'm going to fix all these problems. Thank you, sir. Anyone else on my left care to speak? Anyone else in the chamber? Hearing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Presentations and committee reports by board members. Madam Clark. Mr. Cavalier. Just a couple quick items. On f last Friday, I attended the grand opening ceremony at the Verizon smart store in Stafford Marketplace and Ms. Sellers was there with me along with our economic development staff and uh, it's, it really is a state-of-the-art facility. <coughs> We've only got a few of these in the entire country right now so if you get a chance stop by there. Um, another item was the um, Fredericksburg Regional Alliance meeting yesterday. Um, I did participate w in that and that concludes my report. Ms. Sellers? Uh, in addition to attending the grand opening of Verizon, I, uh, yesterday was GWRC and FAMPO. Um, still the big topic of discussions, HB2, and Mr. Milday will probably go into a little bit more detail. And one of the things that the paper reported that I, I, I kind of disagree with is not that, that supervisors or local <laughs> officials are confused on it, it's that VDOT hasn't put any detail into the implementation plan, and that's the only thing that uh, that I find different from what the paper rep reported. But other than that, um, <coughs> that's all I Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, today we had a finance audit and budget meeting, um, but I would defer my comments until um, item number 15 on the agenda. Ms. Bomke. Uh, I have a couple of things. As part of the National Public Safety Telecommunication Week, Sheriff Jett and his staff last week celebrated and honored the professional men and women answering our 911 and emergency calls. And we obviously recognized them last week, um, but they recognized them again. And Supervisor Snellings and um, Sellers attended this event. And I just want to mention that they, they showed a video that was a typical day of somebody that works in 911. Um, and I can tell you it's a skill to work down in that department. And it's probably something most of us couldn't do. Um, so anyway, uh, the board just thanks them for their service and everyone to the count in the county for what they do. Um, on Sunday afternoon, I attended the um, 50 years of Head Start in Stafford County, along with a lot of st staff, teachers, um, executive directors that were in the program 50 years ago um, and part of the original program. I have to mention that Lou Silver was there. She was the second executive director behind uh, Shirley Heim uh, back in the day. And I'll just say they told a little story about uh, back in the 1970s, there was a possibility that the federal government was going to shut down Head Start programs throughout the nation. And they all said, you know, you need to contact your legislators. You need to contact your legislators. And they all did that. 
because back then Head Start was the number one program in the nation um, and as you know we have one of the best Head Start programs I would say we're in the top three if not at the top still to this day in Stafford County so that's very impressive and um, Anthony was over at that event as well as um, Supervisor Snellings so anyway that's a Im very impressive and it was really great to connect with all those people and and kind of hear their old stories um, today we had a public safety meeting and we discussed the uh, amended county code as it relates to the noise um, and the weapons ordinance um, we have not made any decisions we had a resolution uh, put before us we have deferred that until the May meeting um, members of the committee wanted to think about a few things but I would like to inform the public that last year uh, the 911 call center took 350 noise complaints during that time period so it is um, something that we need to amend to give our staff some more flexibility in how to manage uh, noise levels um, <coughs> from the law enforcement standpoint um, we will be talking also about the no shoot zones in public safety over the next um, three to four months as well and hope to be bringing that resolution back to the board in um, the fall um, I'd also just like to give a shoot out to um, uh, Paul Sante and Sam Pixley from the Utilities Department they use their volunteer United Way volunteer hours to um, assist a 90 year old woman in our community clearing her leaves um, in a ditch so um, thank you to them for their efforts and uh, last is we had our OPEB meeting today our quarterly OPEB um, we currently have about five million dollars in our um, OPEB account and it is uh, monitored and managed by the local um, pool investment down in Richmond um, and we had a presentation by um, PFM they are interested in securing our financial advisor um, business for us to pull that money out of the pooled investment account and have them manage it separately so um, there's going to be more discussion with um, Maria and um, um, Laura Rudy on that topic more to come on that um, and then lastly we also discussed in that meeting um, Cord Sterling and I, I believe last year in April were appointed to the OPEB board and we we were going to have a committee along with the school division um, and I know the schools talked about it but I don't know if the schools ever appointed anyone to that does anybody recall okay maybe that's something that we could get answered in the future um, that's all I have thank you mr. Snellings yeah. uh, thank you I uh, along with mr. Romanella he and I and several other folks here on the team did the uh, Stafford Hospital 5k last Saturday I had a great time huh. I appreciate him let me keep up with him I came in fourth in my age group of course there were only four in my age group <laughs> but <laughs> no we did have a good time and uh, we're going to do the Moss Free Clinic this Sunday. That's at 8.30 at, uh, over near the hospital. So if you've got time, come on by. It's a great time. They serve food and cold beer at the end of the race. So there's no excuse for you not to be there. Uh, I'd like to invite everyone to Ferry Farm this Saturday at 2.30. There will be a groundbreaking for the new, well, I shouldn't say new. They're going to they're gonna put up George Washington's home, a replica, as it was when he lived there. So this is going to be a really big event. Going to be a lot of nationally known people there. Uh, it's free to the public and I urge you to come so if you've got some free time Saturday afternoon at 2 30 it's at Ferry Farm thank you so much Mr. Shoemate defer any comments Mr. Chairman thank you Mr. Romanello Mr. Chairman members of the board will have our monthly reports from Mr. Rapp and Mr. Hoppy on the county's roads and parks projects please Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Christopher Rapp, Director of Public Works. I'm pleased to provide this road construction update. A Mountain View Road Phase 1 construction continues. The uh, contractor has completed the waterline relocation and is excavating for a permanent roadway bed. Mountain View Road Phase 2 construction has started on this project, erosion control installation and uh, initial 
uh, site clearing activities have been completed. The contractor is working on the uh, stormwater management ponds and the temporary road widening. Poplar Road, phase one and two, a notice to proceed has been issued to the contractor. Uh, the contractor will begin placing uh, construction signage in April, and you should be seeing uh, clearing operations the first week in May. Uh, a part in our dust meeting was held uh, at the end of March to inform residents of the uh, upcoming construction activities. Uh, Poplar Road and Mountain View Road intersection, uh, the right-of-way acquisition is underway. Uh, Ten properties will be impacted and offer letters will be going out to those uh, properties, um, property owners soon. The Brook Road um, project, uh, right-of-way um, acquisition continues. There's a total of 25 properties to be impacted. Uh, agreements have been reached with uh, some of those property owners and we continue negotiations with uh, the remaining owners. Um, and uh, the Truslow Road project, uh, construction plan authorization has been received from VDOT. We're finalizing the right-of-way uh, acquisition. Dominion Power um, is out on-site relocating utilities. The start of uh, construction will begin mid-May, and we uh, had a part in our dust meeting um, with residents at the end of March as well. Um, Garrisonville Road widening, we anticipate right-of-way plan authorization from VDOT at any time. Um, once we do get that authorization, we'll begin the right-of-way acquisition for the Garrisonville Road widening. And lastly, the um, Courthouse Streetscape. Um, this project um, is substantially complete, and uh, the contractor is finalizing just the last few uh, punch list items on the uh, streetscape plan. Um, and I'd, that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Chris Hoppe, Capital Improvement Program Manager. I'm providing a report on capital projects, uh, park projects. The Jeff Rouse Swim and Sports Center, uh, unfortunately, frequent rains continue to hamper our progress on that project. However, the entrance road has been uh, put in stone base and a portion of the parking lot has also been stoned. Um, we have, we're working on the masonry walls now, finally. Now the block can get around to the various parts of the building. We have reviewed uh, change order, uh, and we have approved change orders for weather delay claims for the first half of winter, and that has pushed our completion date to December 24, 2015. We're currently reviewing additional weather delay claims for the latter half of winter at this point. The uh, Emory Mill Park itself, we should notice proceed to the contractor on May 2, March 2. They've mobilized at the end of March. They're uh, beginning to work on water and sewer lines, extending those from the indoor rec facility site heading north into the athletic fields area. And the work on retaining wall three is underway as weather permits progress uh, on grading the first synthetic turf, uh, the first two of the synthetic turf fields will begin. Uh, those, those two turf fields are going to be under construction uh, early May. Woodstream Trail to Smith Lake, we should notice proceed on April 2nd. Held a pre-construction meeting April 7th. Survey work is uh, occurring this week. We're going to begin to install ENS controls next week. And we do have a groundbreaking event scheduled for May 5 at 5 o'clock in the Luca, um, sorry, Woodstream development on Lucas Lane. Hope you all can come. Uh, Belmont Ferry Farm Trail Phase 4. VDOT has approved, locally anyway, the revised bid documents and plans for the Belmont crosswalks. <coughs> and uh, they've sent the package to Richmond for their final approval to, to allow us to bid that work. Uh, we met with planning to resolve a few trail plan review comments and uh, resolve some of those comments with National Park Service. And as a result, we submitted a the public hearing transcript and the, the right-of-way authorization plan to VDOT last week for their uh, approval for us to begin acquiring right-of-way for the trail. And we also submitted the second review to the planning department. That's the end of my report. Thank you. Any questions, Chris? Anything at all? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, we have our next installment in our Above and Beyond video series about uh, some of uh, Stafford's very impressive young people. So please.
County government employees are proud of the work that they do to take care of our community. They go above and beyond every day to ensure that Stafford County is a place where residents can live, work, and raise a family. Here are their stories. We felt a need in our educational outreach program to reach our students here in Stafford County. Uh, we have a very large population of school-age children here in Stafford County. About a quarter of our entire population is made up of school-age children. Not many people realize that. So there is a very big focus on our children here in this community. So we figured, okay, uh, let's reach out to them and see if we can educate them a little bit further on how their local government works. Uh, we invite all third grade classes in Stafford County to uh, schedule a date that they would like to come visit the government center here and we'll take them on a little tour. Um, and give them some historical uh, perspective of the county. We also do a mock board meeting which gives them a real hands-on experience of how their local government works and how decisions are made and how laws are made here for us here in Stafford County. Um, Student Government Day is another outreach program that we have annually. Uh, we have select seniors from all the different high schools here in Stafford County that get to participate in the program. Um, they'll come earlier to uh, here to the Government Center and we'll all meet in the board chambers. Uh, we'll go over a little bit of generalities as far as their local government. Um, and then the students have a great opportunity to shadow employees that work here within the county. Um, not only within this building, but within the judicial building, within the sheriff's department, fire and rescue, parks and recreation, uh, the whole nine yards. We get every department covered pretty much. Uh, that gives them a real practical experience on what it is to work in local government. Well, I think it's not only important to students, it's important to all of us. Uh, it gets our young people involved at a very early age. I think that in today's society, so many young people, uh, as a matter of fact, so many adults just disengage themselves from government. And if you're going to make a difference, you've got to be involved. And the earlier they get involved, uh, the more active they'll be in later life. One, <clears throat> one final item before we get into our agenda changes. The, the chairman mentioned the, mentioned the Stafford Hospital 5K. There was another race earlier this week up in Boston. Uh, it's a full 26 miles, the Boston Marathon. Joey Hess in our Public Works Department ran it. He finished 758 out of 30,000 total runners. His pace was 6 minutes 36 seconds per mile, which is just slightly faster than Chairman Snelling's on our race yes, just uh, a little bit, Saturday uh, <laughs> morning. So congratulations to uh, uh, to Joey. He was there two years ago un unharmed, of course, uh, during the, the bombing. So I know he was glad to, to get back there. The last thing I'll mention, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, is that item number 19 will be moved to the board's May 5th agenda. And as Mr. Thomas presents uh, the recommendations of the board's Finance Audit and Budget Committee from earlier today, there's a handout in your add-on folder for that, and uh, that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. No additions and deletions. We'll move to the consent agenda. Does anyone wish to pull anything from consent? Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Cast your votes. Tally vote. Motion carries six to nothing with one absent. Item number 14, Utilities General Capital Improvement Program Update. Mr. Smith. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Mike Smith, and I am the Director of Utilities. Um, I've been asked to do a quick review of the CIP Utilities Update, and uh, I'll go through that relatively quickly. So if there are any questions, please stop me as we go. Um, We've been working closely with the economic development to identify areas in a county where we have a lot of interest in development, but we don't have the infrastructure and we don't have a large person coming in to take up the whole area and do the infrastructure themselves. It's a lot of smaller pockets. And without that infrastructure, we can't get the uh, economic development moving. Those areas are the uh, courthouse redevelopment area, Centerport Parkway, and Boswell's Corner. 
In the courthouse redevelopment area, it's primarily sewer infrastructure that's needed. It's approximately $10.6 million of infrastructure. This will just be the main lines. All the individual lines that go to each property will still be put in by the developers. Developers will also still be required to pay the pro rata and availability on those properties. Centerport area is another area that needs both water infrastructure and sewer infrastructure. The water infrastructure is about 4.6 million and the sewer infrastructure is about 5.4 million. This will get it started. We'll need additional water pumped over in that area in the future, but the booster pump will get us moving. The Boswell Mr. Chair. area. I'm sorry, Mr. Thomas. Just a quick question. Back to the Centerport one. Yes. Um, I saw quite a few comments um, across social media when, when we first talked about this. Um, some people were convinced that this was uh, county putting infrastructure in for the George Washington Village project, and I just wanted to hear from you that that's that's not what these are. This does not have anything to do with the George Washington area. The George Washington area is on a different sewer shed, and so it will not connect with that at all. It, it won't uh, help that development at all. That's one large development, so they'll be required to put in all the infrastructure themselves. And the infrastructure in these other areas, although the developers are not putting it in themselves, they still will be paying the county back over the years with the rata fees. Thanks for clarifying. And Mr. Chairman. Yes, Ms. Mill. The, are you going to tell us the condition of the current condition of availability for uh, water or sewer in the courthouse area or center port? Uh, right now, the uh, courthouse area the water availability is fine we have enough water in that area the sewer there is little to no infrastructure in that area so it needs to be put in in order to develop that area at all in the center port area we have water however we don't have enough volume for fire safety and so in order to build any commercial development any economic development we have to have a higher volume we have a large 18 inch line that runs through down centerport parkway but we have an 8 inch line and 12 inch line that feed into it so it doesn't give enough volume to provide adequate fire flow that's why we need to get the booster pump station so we can pull more water into that area as far as the sewer there's no sewer in that area so a, a collection line would have to be run from the um, potomac creek pump station cross 95 over there and once that's done the Potomac Creek pump station would have to be upgraded in order to handle that additional capacity and so those are the improvements that are planned and have you seen or has Tim seen that not having the capacity in either of those areas has um, dissuaded people from developing yes we've had a lot of people that have come and been interested in those areas however once they found out the infrastructure that was needed and the amount of money for a small area they might do they decided to wait until somebody else comes in and puts in the infrastructure. So that's been going on for several years. That's why we want to try to move this forward. Yes. Uh, Boswell's Corner is the third area. We, um, we have several potential economic development opportunities down there, one of which is data centers, which is a high volume user. And therefore, um, we would need to improve both the water and sewer in that area. That's about $2.7 million worth of improvements. We also have some projects in the out years which will help move water, like I said, over to that center port area. The, the booster pump and the tank will get us started, but we'll need to move water from Lake Mooney over to that area in the future. Um, we have about $10 million worth of projects from 2020 on for the water side. We have about $20 million worth of projects for the sewer. Most of that is in the north for the Aquia Creek, Austin Ron, Camp Barrett pump stations. Right now, those are coming to the end of their useful life so they need to be re replaced because they're deteriorating also we could increase the capacity at that same time to handle more flow with the added projects that will help spur our economic development we will have to put a large investment of over 20 million dollars over the next three years in order to get these moving that 20 million dollars will deplete our reserves and not allow us to complete the rest of our needed CIP projects. Therefore, we will need a uh, utility rate increase in order to handle these projects. The increase that we have proposed for the for fiscal year 17, 18, 19 is 9%. That 9%, um, from our financial policy, we plan to have a 3 or 4% every year in order to stay with the, the economy, the, the inflation. This 9% would be a little bit on top of that 3%, and this would allow us have the needed infrastructure improvements plus make those CIP improvements for the uh, economic development. Economic development, as I mentioned, will still pay, pay pro rata and availability, so that money will come back and it can be used for capacity improvement, I mean for rehabilitation improvements that are much needed in our system. Our system mainly was put in between 80 and 90. It's getting to be 25, 35 years old, and a lot of the pipes are in pretty bad shape and need to be replaced. So that money will go towards that. 
Excuse me, Mike. Did you say that 9% is on in addition to the 3? No. It's 9% total. Okay. So it's really only a 6% increase above the 3. That above the 3. Okay. I think. Thank you for clarifying that. When, you, when we are asked to vote on the CIP for utilities, will we also simultaneously be asked to vote on the, on the No, rates? this is just an update. We're not asking for a revenue increase at this time. We're just letting you know that when we do come back and ask for it, we're just letting you know where we will be, and I'm sure we'll get more into it at that time. At that point, we could talk about comparisons of other, with other, other localities. And Correct. And the next slide the need. talks about comparisons of localities. Um, currently, we're the lowest of our peer localities. If we are awarded the 9% in the three years and nobody else has an increase at all, four years from now we'll be at the state average. So even with those increases, it would put us just at the state average in 2015. Um, this is just a, a graphic of if we get the 9%, where it will be. The red line is our minimum by our financial policy. The purple line is our goal of 300 days total cash in case there's a some cat catastrophic break, we would be able to still move forward, and this keeps us with a good bond rating. Are there any questions? Any questions, Mr. Smith? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. If I may just clarify, going, <clears throat> going back to, to Mr. Milday's question and just to amplify what Mr. Smith had to say, the 6% the that will take effect this summer was authorized by the board a couple of years ago. In the FY17 budget process, we would we would come back with rate adjustments at that time. This is a forecast uh, based on uh, today's best information. So this time next year, the board will be in a position to set those rates uh, going forward. So I just wanted to put a little bit to the to the timing of that. The CIP that's in front of you uh, today does contemplate moving forward on those projects at Centerport and um, and in the courthouse area. But again, those are uh, those are multi-year projects. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Seller. Mr. Romano, could you just, we had a conversation a couple weeks ago about the utility rates. Could you just go over, and what I had asked Mr. Romanello was, I've a been asked questions of how the utility fund uh, compares to the general fund, and right. people think we raise utility rates and that that somehow trickles down into the general fund or vice versa. And so if you could just go over. No, no, that, that's right. They're, they're completely separate funds. Our utility fund is, is an enterprise fund. All its only source of revenues are from the user fees that water and sewer customers in the county pay, as well as uh, availability fees, which are, which are paid uh, when uh, a building or a home uh, comes online into the system. Developers also pray, pay pro rata, pro rata fees, which are part of their cost for the uh, distribution and collection uh, systems in the county. All those are the only sources of revenues. There is, there are, there is no general fund support of the utilities department, um, and there is no uh, support of the utilities department of the general fund. They're, they're kept uh, completely independent. And what you're looking at here is the, the revenue stream uh, for our water and sewer utilities in the county. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Item number 15, finance and budget, authorized proposed calendar year 2015 tax rates, proposed fiscal year 2016 county budget, and proposed fiscal year 2016-2025 capital improvement program. Mr. County Attorney, I think we need to take these resolutions separately, correct? Uh, that's correct. I think that'd be best uh, as opposed to bundling. That'd Thank you. I'll turn it over to the Finance and Budget Chairman, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can I have a computer, please? We had our final uh, FAB meeting today, and we ironed out a recommendation to bring to the board, um, which did have unanimous support from the FAB. Um, I will note that one of the things that was nice this year is every time we had a FAB meeting, um, the superintendent was there, as well as uh, several board members from the school board. So when questions came up, it was easy to be able to just look across the room, ask the question, and get answers. So um, that was a, a good highlight uh, this year. Um, the revenue summary um, has not changed a whole lot since the county administrator's proposed budget. Um, it says no tax or fee changes. I will point out that that is no tax rate changes. Um, for example, you can see that by keeping the same tax rate, we actually do bring in uh, additional real estate actual tax money um, by keeping the, that straight. So. Uh, the total take, if you add up all the puts and takes, was about $2.8 million. Uh, next slide. So wh what does this budget accomplish? Um, the, the budget accomplishes goals of our priority plan, 
One of those is fiscal responsibility. Um, as you can see, no fee or tax rate increases. Um, we are working on a shared services study with the schools, which is coming along very well. Um, and our debt capacity has been lowered to about $327 million um, from the adopted CIP last year, which was around $349 million. Um, that's mainly been driven by our board policies and the reduction in a couple of things like uh, gas tax. So we are sticking to our, our priorities and our policies. In the area of public safety, uh, this budget adds three positions. Uh, one of those is a training officer, which went away for a while, and uh, the, the Public Safety Committee felt strongly that that needed to come back, and the department found a way to make that happen that was budget neutral. Um, the Sheriff's Office is having two new full-time positions, um, fraud investigators. That's becoming a, a key area of crime that's, that's risen recently, so the board is working with the Sheriff's Office to respond to those, those needs of the community and we're converting a courts deputy and an, a part-time investigator to full-time. Again, those are budget neutral because the sheriff's office was able to find savings within their budget to convert these positions to the authorized strength. In the area of education, uh, one of the board's priorities when we sat down with county staff this year was um, to try to give every dollar of our new revenue to the schools. Um, and th this budget accomplishes that. We have an uh, additional 2.6 million going over to the school system um, and the accomplishment there we believe is that there's enough room for a salary increase of two percent for the schools that's um, all all personnel not just teachers we're covering the increased debt service from the school projects that we've undertaken recently uh, this includes the VRS 55 there was um, an out-of-pocket expense um, that if not covered would cause actual take-home pay to go down so we believe them uh, with this funding that that should be taken care of and something new that came up um, Ms. Sellers and Ms. Baumke uh, brought it to my attention and discussed it with school staff that new teachers when they first came on board would go through an institute where they didn't receive any pay for several weeks um, so we were able to work in um, to our budget in the fab um, about eighty thousand dollars to go towards that in addition to that the uh, the two studies we've done recently, the Shared Services Study and the Schools Efficiency Study, uh, recommended that the school board does not have to do a full audit because we already audit most of the accounts. So if we combine the $75,000 savings there with the 80, that should be around $150,000 to, to help those new teachers um, that are new to the system that have to go to this required uh, institute. Um, as the superintendent pointed out, it's not necessarily brand new teachers. It's uh, any teacher who's new to our system. So this will go a long way towards um, making them feel like they're, uh, they're valued from day one. And we know that the starting teacher salary is something that both boards are targeting. And we think this will be good. And in addition to that, we found a way to um, provide funding for 10 school buses, which is about a million dollars. Um, that was a, a big portion of the chunk where the two boards' uh, budgets didn't quite meet. So that's um, the accomplishments, I think, as far as education goes. Another board priority is uh, economic development. We are fully funding our opportunity fund. Uh, there's funds to continue executing our strategic plan. And the tech and research board is up and running and um, we have a strategic plan that was built there and hopefully soon here we'll, we'll be putting budget dollars to making that vision come to be as well. And as you just heard from Mr. Smith, um, our s utility CIP is now starting to, to really take in economic development instead of just trying to do play catch up on all the projects we have. So that's a, a step in the right direction towards the board priority as well. Uh, board priority of infrastructure projects. So you can see we have 31 projects in the pipeline where we're definitely um, making sure the budget delivers on those uh, priorities. And as far as service excellence, um, you'll notice that we have a 2% raise for county employees as well. Um, and we we recently did a classification and compensation study and there's several recommendations that came out of that several phases over the next couple of years that we'll need to tackle um, but the first one identified a, around 42 I believe 42 individuals who um, were, were below basically the, the 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 bottom of the market for their specific position so the fab is recommending that we take ninety thousand um, dollars and apply that and get those 42 individuals back up to where they should be and we also um, are adding to the end strength two new park employees 
um, which has been funded with savings and then two social services employees actually we had a late breaking development from the state budget where two hundred thousand dollars came in um, from the state to be used for that so that's budget neutral as well uh, the next slide so uh, the budget summary basically as you can see we directed county administrator to take all of our new revenue and, and give it to the schools you'll see that we did that with the exception of the two hundred thousand that I just talked about that was new general government dollars that had to be spent there because it was specifically earmarked from the state so I believe we've accomplished that goal and the last slide is just a summary of all those things I just talked about um, the resolutions you have before you um, will accomplish this budget I'm not sure if there's any major comments from board members that need to be addressed at this point um, if not Ms. Boppy under the economic development the tech and research center strategic plan didn't we have George Mason weren't they a partner of ours up at the Quantico corporate center um, Mr. Broody could probably speak to the more specifics of that. I think the short answer is, is yes. Um, currently, we're not using any general fund dollars to, to fund that body yet. Uh, there was a state grant that came in to accomplish the strategic plan, which um, was, was delivered, I believe, and we've, we've checked the box for that. So the next phase really is to come to the board probably in the next budget year and, and figure out how we execute. Where did George Mason go? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Tim Brody, Deputy County Administrator. George Mason is uh, still working with us. I did get an, an email from their Vice President of Community Affairs just last week. They've had some transition. So the bottom line is they, they were a party to the 2010 arrangement, uh, the MOU that the county signed with Germana Community College, G George Mason, Stafford County as participants. But uh, they have not yet uh, uh, stepped up to uh, the level we had hoped they would step up to, and that is the uh, facilitator of an incubator. Uh, that's the conversation we've been having for more than a year with them, but because of the transition most recently, uh, they haven't been able to commit to that. And they, and they may not uh, um, ever be able to commit to that, but uh, we continue to work with them throughout that process. The Tech and Research Park Board should meet again May 11th, if all goes well, and we'll further discuss uh, sort of next steps. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Ms. Tom? With that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move um, resolution R15-93, which sets the tax rates, tax rates for the year. Do I have a second? I have a second in the discussion. Cast your votes. Tally the votes. Motion passes 6 to 0, 1 absent. Mr. Thomas. Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer resolution R15-94, which uh, will include the changes that came from the FAB today as well. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Cavalier. Cast your votes. Out of the votes, motion passes 6 to 0. Mr. Thomas. Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer resolution R15-95, which appropriates the budget. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Milde. Any discussion? Cast your votes. Tally the votes. Motion passes 6 to 0. Mr. Thomas. And finally, Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer resolution R15-96, which approves the capital improvement program. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Sellers. Any discussion? Cast your votes. Tally the vote. Motion passes six to zero with one absent. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. It was a very good report. Mr. Thank Mr. you to the committee. Mr. Honestly, this is one of the no, best, one was. of the smoothest we've ever had yep. between the superintendent and your your committee. I have I've been sitting here for a long time, and this is about as uh, it's gone as about as well as it could ever been. ever yes. have hoped for. I hope that everyone walks away feeling as as good as I do about it. Thank yep. you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Dr. Benson. Item number sixteen. Finance and budget authorized fiscal year 2016-2017, Virginia Public School Authority, BPSA debt. Area. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. On April 14th, the board held a public hearing to consider participation in VPSA bonds for school capital projects in the amount of $26.8 million. Resolutions are 15117 and 107 authorize the bonds to be sold and budget and appropriate the proceeds they are consistent with the just adopted CIP staff re does recommend approval I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have any questions yes mr. Milde. Any, any, is any of the Stafford High School in here um, no sir the Stafford High School bonds were previously authorized and appropriated this uh, is primarily the expansion projects as well as Moncure Elementary and some infrastructure projects 
All right. Thank you. I'm bringing it back to the board. I'm sorry, Ms. Bumke. Yes. Um, in light of the the situation with the bidding on their projects, um, is this going to take into account that issue, or are they coming back to us, or do you know, Maria? Um, my understanding, we have been working with school staff on this. There will be um, probably an, a request for an additional appropriation from, from other so sources. There may be a slight reworking. Those would all be finalized before the last step, which would be needed for these bonds for the 16 sale in the fall. Okay. So there was something would be coming back. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Saying none, I'll bring it back to the board. Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer Resolution R15-117. I have a motion on a second by Mr. Cavalier. Any discussion? Cast your votes. Tally the votes. Uh, Ms. Bonke, you didn't hit. Okay, tally, uh, cast your votes again, please. Tally the vote. Motion passes 6 to 0 with one absent. Now, item number 17, finance and budget. Mr. Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse I'd like me. You've got two resolutions. Yep. Offer resolution R15-107, which budgets and appropriates the proceeds of the bonds. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Sellers. Any discussion? Cast your votes. Tally the vote. Motion passes 6 to 0 with one absent. Item number 17, finance and budget. We appropriate remaining FY14 school carryover funds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Resolution R15-127 reappropriates $500,000 of remaining 2014 school carryover funds. The funds were requested for one-time costs associated with the new financial system for schools. Um, we do anticipate a request for the balance of the funds needed for uh, the project to be coming from a school financing. We anticipate that will be brought forward to the board at the May 5th meeting following action by the school board. Staff does recommend approval. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion to approve and second by Ms. Sellers. Any discussion? Cast your vote. Tell the vote. Motion passes six to zero with one absent. Item number 18. Planning and zoning refer to the Planning Commission amendments to County Code Section 22-153, lots for required buffers, Section 22-267, open space land regulations, Section 22-270, review and approval of cluster subdivision plans, and Section 2-82, required buffers regarding open space land in cluster subdivisions. That was a mouthful. Ms. Bumke. Yes, I would just... Um, like to refresh everybody's memory we had on our legislative agenda um, an item that we sent down to the general assembly regarding clusters and they sent back to us um, via our lobbyists that they felt that we had enough flexibility in the uh, language approved at the state level that we could go back and uh, make our ordinance more specific if we chose to do so. So that's why I've bought, brought this forward. Um, I've heard from other board members that they feel that this needs to be reviewed again down at the Planning Commission, and um, so that's where we are. Mr. Harvey? Yes, Mr. To add? Mr. Chairman, um, in discussing the issue with Ms. Baumke, I provide some examples of previous cluster plans that the board has uh, reviewed in the past to illustrate some of the issues that were um, previously discussed. Um, there are four recent cases in the last two years from the time period when the board reestablished our cluster regulations pursuant to state code. This uh, project shown on the screen here is Courthouse Manor. Uh, with Courthouse Manor, there's significant green areas. However, many of them are in buffer zones, as I'm highlighting around the um, project. That was one of the concerns that the uh, board had was the uh, relatively small strips of land that were used for open space requirements. Uh, similarly, um, another project we had recently, which is instead of a conditional use permit, a buy right in the R1 zone, which was reserve of Woodstock, um, that project had a significant amount of open space, which is more consolidated. And in general, people felt more pleased with the overall configuration of this um, open space. However, there was some buffering that was used in this particular project. Um, they would have still met all the requirements based on what the board's uh, proposed ordinance is, as well as the plan commission's guidelines that it's currently working on. Uh, this is the Shelton Knowles project um, in the uh, Rock Hill district off of Courthouse Road and Shelton Shop Road. Um, there again were sm relatively small areas of 
open space in, in various corners of the project. And these were some of the things that the board in the past has had some concerns about as far as overall configuration of the open space areas. And then the first one that we encountered in 2013 was Brook Village um, off of Little Wim Road. And their open space was, again, a couple small strips, but then also with entirely within a resource protection area. And some of the effects of the amendment would not only deal with the buffers, but also stipulate that the owners have to identify what type of open space it's going to be. Um, by state code, it has to either be designated for recreational purposes, agriculture, forestry, or otherwise good subdivision uh, design. And as I mentioned, the commission has been working on and is authorized a public hearing for a proposed amendment to the comprehensive plan, which would help the Board of Supervisors in your review of rezonings and conditional use permits uh, and giving the developers and the board guidance as to what's the proper configuration of, of open space areas as well as um, the intended uses for those open space areas. Any questions for Mr. Harvey? Thank you, Mr. Harvey. I'll bring it back to board, Ms. Bomke. Uh, I move for um, approval of R15-123. I have a motion by Ms. Bompe, a second by Ms. Sellers. Any discussion? Hearing none, cast your votes. Tally the vote. Motion passes 6 to 0 with one absent. That concludes our afternoon agenda. Will Mr. Thomas, would you take Mr. a turn to... Oh, I'm sorry. We do, we do have uh, item 20 and 21. Oh, I'm sorry. You're exactly right. Mr. Chairman. I saw the line. Uh, item number 20, County Administration, authorize the County Administrator to advertise a public hearing to consider landfill construction financing. And I thought we were going to be out here by 4 o'clock. Isn't that something? <laughs> well, like Mr. running Chairman, at 5K. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, members of the Board, Keith Dayton, Deputy County Administrator, here to discuss uh, item 20 in uh, concert with uh, Ms. Perrott uh, about the uh, possibility of uh, our uh, Board of Supervisors' support for landfill uh, financing. Uh, the Rappahannock Regional Landfill is a uh, joint powers uh, agency agreement between the City of Fredericksburg and uh, Stafford County, and it serves only those residents and businesses of uh, the city and the county. Uh, the current landfill cell, that's F1, uh, that we have in use is uh, uh, just about out of capacity. We expect it to be uh, exhausted uh, around the end of this year. We're thinking probably December. Uh, in anticipation of this, uh, we proceeded to design uh, the next cell, that's cell F2. Uh, it was uh, also permitted uh, and offered for uh, public bids. This uh, new cell will provide approximately seven years of solid waste landfilling capacity. Uh, in response to our uh, public offering, we received five bids, uh, T and K construction, uh, was the lowest responsive bidder. Their bid was uh, five million, uh, about five million sixty-three thousand uh, dollars. They are the contractor who completed uh, the current cell we're working in, so we feel like they're uh, qualified uh, and certainly recommend uh, that we proceed with them. Uh, however, we do need uh, some financing for this, and we also. Uh, need to uh, complete some wetland mitigation uh, uh, by credits basically for just under a hundred thousand uh, we also have uh, 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 offers for that as well we solicited uh, quotes for that uh, and we we are ready to proceed with that uh, the uh, total of five million one hundred and sixty two thousand dollars uh, we are uh, proposing to to fund uh, by a method that Ms. Perrott uh, will, will discuss in more detail. And I'll remind the board that as a joint powers uh, agency, uh, the R board is not authorized to uh, uh, issue any debt. So uh, we are actually coming uh, to speak about this with the Board of Supervisors and uh, the City Council will be taking it up as well. I'll turn this over to Ms. Perrott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Of the five, roughly $5.2 million project, staff would recommend a million sixty-seven thousand be funded with cash in the landfill reserve funds. That's the balance of the reserve funds after allowing for closure costs and uh, operating reserve. 
Uh, the balance in one of about 4.1 million would need to be funded by the participating localities, with Staffordshire being just a little bit over two million dollars. We would anticipate working with Virginia Resources Authority to borrow those funds. Are uh, resulting in about $350,000 in annual debt service that would be financed over the seven-year useful life of the, uh, of, this, of the cell being built. The landfill would dedicate a revenue stream from user fees to cover the debt service. We would um, see no impact on the debts on the debt capacity or the CIP of the county using this structure. A public hearing is required in order to authorize the debt. The resolution before you simply sets the public hearing after which uh, the board would consider authorizing the debt. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Sellers. Mr. Dayton, so if we don't fund the, the new cell, what happens to the landfill it closes? Well, we will be out of capacity, as I mentioned, by the end of the year. Once we're out of capacity, then we'll be uh, basically forced to, to close uh, by the state agency. Any other questions? I'll bring it back uh, to the board. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Bumke. Um, At this point in time, because I know you gave us an update, and I don't want exact numbers, but um, how much have we collected in fees and uh, coupons? Uh, Ms. Bumke, uh, just recently uh, we reported to the R Board that we were at about $293,000. Uh, that was a few days ago, so we were probably right at around the $300,000 mark in uh, resident user fees. Any other questions? I'll bring it back to the board. Mr. Mildy? I'll move. I have a motion by Mr. Mildy and a second by Ms. Sellers. Uh, any discussion? Cast your votes. Tally the vote. Motion passes 6 to 0 with one absent. Item number 21. County Administration authorizes the County Administrator to execute an agreement with Ferry Farm for county support for, of their expansion reports. Efforts, I'm sorry. Mr. Chairman and <coughs> members of the board, this matter was brought in part to the board's infrastructure committee at your meeting uh, just a week ago. Uh, the county uh, is looking to be in partnership with the George Washington Ferry Farm Foundation for intersection improvements at the Route 3 Ferry Road intersection. This is in the county's capital improvement program and is funded uh, with impact fees. It makes sense for their entrance uh, to the National Historic Site to line up with the new intersection and so that we are proposing to incorporate those into the county's project. Uh, to uh, make those changes would require an additional $940,000 in the project budget and VDOT has asked for a commitment from the county uh, uh, toward that, uh, those uh, uh, that uh, addition, those additional expenses are revenue sharing eligible, and so four hundred seventy thousand dollars would come from next year's revenue sharing allocation, and the other four hundred seventy thousand dollars would need to come from additional sources. The sources that we have identified uh, would be four hundred nine thousand dollars in a promissory note, which will be paid uh, to the county next month. This was executed in nineteen ninety nine as reimbursement to the county for purchasing the property originally uh, back in the late 90s. That leaves us about $61,000 short and we would recommend that $61,000 come from the tourism fund balance to round out the two numbers. Uh, since we can't be assured of revenue sharing money, we wrote into the, res into the recommended resolution that the appropriation would be contingent upon receipt of revenue sharing money. Uh, the construction activity will um, help make uh, this new tourism asset in uh, Stafford work. Uh, a recent economic analysis estimates that when the Washington House is rebuilt, over 100,000 visitors will come to the Washington property in, in the county that would generate $22 million in, in actual indirect and induced expenditures and well over a million dollars in local taxes generated. So we believe with this investment by the board, we would reap that back many fold over uh, over a period of time. Uh, the revenue sharing uh, uh, picture is um, considerably less next year that we'll be uh, requesting uh, given where we've been in the past. We, our request right now is about $1.5 million based on the CIP the board just approved. This would push it, push that request to about $2 million. The maximum any locality can request is $10 million a year, so we would be well below uh, uh, that threshold. As the board is aware, this Saturday, uh, the Ferry Farm Foundation will be holding a groundbreaking ceremony 
on site for the Washington House and beginning to um, to build that asset into the National Historic Site that it will be very soon. Proposed resolution R15-145 would make all this work and we recommend approval. Any questions? I'm right back to the board, Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clarify um, just a couple of things. Um, Anthony and I were able to meet with George Washington Foundation this week. Um, they had no problems with the extra language we added about if for some reason revenue sharing fell off. They understood uh, that, that requirement since this project is new. Um, as Anthony pointed out, I feel very comfortable now knowing that we were only planning on asking for less than $2 million next year in revenue sharing, where typically we've been asking for 10 So I think we have uh, plenty of leeway there. Um, and, and thirdly, um, you know, it's been contemplated, um, at least since I came on the board, um, when I did my changeover with Dr. Crisp, that this promissory note was coming to the county in a couple of years, and it's always kind of been contemplated that the county would hopefully somehow be able to donate that back to the, to the project. Um, Anthony didn't really say a whole lot about it, but when we met with VDOT, um, their initial answer was we couldn't really, you know, revenue share and match that money and basically double the money. Um, but he did push back on that, and uh, central office um, with VDOT came back and agreed that um, that for various reasons we could do that. So I think this is a very creative approach where we can take the 409000 and, and basically double it into, you know, uh, 900000 um, which is a sizable donation to kick off the project. So I hope for the board's support on this, and with that I'll move for the resolution, R15-145. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Milder. Any discussion? Cast your votes. Tally the vote. Motion passes six to zero with one absent. <coughs> Mr. Thomas, would you take us into closed session? Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer a resolution authorizing a closed meeting, whereas the board desires to hold a closed meeting for number one, discussion concerning a prospective business where no previous announcement has been made of the business's interest in locating its facilities in the county, and two, consultation with legal counsel regarding 19 strategies versus border supervisor CL 14-1203 and pursuant to the Virginia code 2.2-3711 uh, alpha 5 and alpha 7 this discussion is allowed to occur in a closed meeting I have a motion to have a second second, second. mr. Cavalier cast your votes tally the vote mr. Thomas you need to push the button uh, miss vote again please tally Motion passes six to nothing. It's all right, Ms. Bumper, you voted before. We're in closed session. Thank you very much. The next meeting will be at
Do I have a motion to certify? Motion to certify. Motion to certify. Do I have a second? Okay. Second. Cash your ballot. Votes. Tally the vote. Motion passes six to nothing, one absent. We were adjourned until 7 p.m. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 7 p.m. session of the March 21st Board of Supervisors meeting. I would ask Ms. Bumpkett to lead us in prayer, followed by the pledge led by Mr. Mildy. Let us pray. Lord, we seek your guidance in the business that is before us. In planning for the future, give us vision. In matters of finance, give us responsibility. And in dealing with people, give us love. Lord, last weekend, Grace Rebecca Mann, a University of Mary Washington student, was tragically killed by a housemate and fellow student. From McLean, Virginia, Grace Mann had distinguished herself as a leading advocate for victims of domestic and sexual assault among her peers on the college campus. She was very supportive of our CASA and Empower House, two of our partner agencies. Please provide support for her family as they grieve the loss of their loved one during this very difficult time. Lord, we also ask for your support and prayer for our men and women in our military services across the world that continue to put their lives on the line so we can live a safer life here in Stafford County. As we salute our flag, let us remember it signifies purity, innocence, valor, bravery, vigilance, perseverance, and justice for all. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, Ms. Sellers will make a presentation or a proclamation for County Day. County Day of Recognition for National Service, Ms. Sellers. Yes. And <coughs> um, I'd like to call up, is it Shanna Butchard? How do you say your name? <laughs> Butchard. Um, and then the folks from Good Skills Literacy Corps, Dominique Thomas, Megan King, and Kelly Nicholson, uh, Lauren Whalen. Kreutzer, and then Jane Walters as well. If you guys want to come around here, come actually up here. Okay. Oh. Hello, ladies. How are you? You want to come stand over here? So it's one of the most fun parts about being a supervisor is to get to actually honor the folks in the community who do the hard work, um, whether it's the Eagle Scouts or folks like you guys. So we want to thank you guys for the hard work that you put into the community and, and welcome you to the chamber. Um, today we have a proclamation signed by the seven of us to recognize the County Day of Recognition for National Service and the volunteers who serve our communities. And I'll read the proclamation. Whereas service to others is a hallmark of the American spirit and Whereas volunteers with the Mayor Corps and Senior Corps address the most pressing challenges facing our communities from educating students for the jobs in the 21st century and supporting veterans and military families to providing health services and helping communities recover from natural disasters. And whereas AmeriCorps and Senior Corps participants serve in more than 60,000 locations across the country, bolstering the civic, neighborhood, and faith-based organizations that are so vital to our economic and social well-being. And whereas national service represents a unique public-private partnership that invests in community solutions and leverages non-federal resources to strengthen community impact and increase the return on taxpayers' dollars. Whereas the Corporation for National and Community Service shares a nationwide priority to engage citizens, improve lives, and strengthen communities. And joined with the National Association of Counties and Executives across the country for the, day, for the county day of recognition for national service held on April 7, 2015. And whereas AmeriCorps 
coordinated volunteers who have aided Stafford County and its residents through Habitat for Humanity, Goodwill Industries, and the Rappahannock Council Against Sexual Assault and the George Washington Regional Commission. Now therefore be it proclaimed by the Stafford County Board of Supervisors on this 21st day of April 2015 that it be and hereby does recognize the County Day of Recognition for National Service and encourage residents to recognize the positive impact of national service to our, our county. To thank those who serve and find ways to give back to their communities. So I want to thank you guys for all that you do. And uh, this is just a small token, but thank you ladies. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you guys want to say something? You want to say something? Sure. Hi guys. Yeah, so we're the Good Skills Literacy Corps. Um, we operate out of Rappahannock Goodwill Industries. Um, we help people in um, counties such as Spotsylvania, Fredericksburg, and Stafford. I'm actually the lead person here in Stafford. And what we do, it's amazing work and I love doing it. We help adults improve their reading, writing, and math skills. Um, we have students from other countries who want to learn to speak English. We have students who want to get their GED. And we have students who just want to be able to read a book to their grandkids. Um, it's amazing work. Um, and we also have a wonderful group of community volunteers, many of which are in Stafford, who help kind of forward our mission. And the best thing is that they do this all out of the kindness of their hearts, um, all for free. And it's, it's amazing work. It's a completely free service to anybody over the age of 18 and in the community. We've been able to help a lot of people through that. So yeah, thank you. Did you want to speak? I am Jane Walters. I am an AmeriCorps VISTA for Greater Fredericksburg Habitat for Humanity. And I work with Habitat um, to improve volunteer experiences because everything that we do is made possible by our volunteers. And that's my job to help with that resource as we work to build affordable housing in our area. So I'm really excited to be here tonight and thank you for having me. I'll be quick. Um, my name is Shannon Butchard. I'm the manager of volunteer services for Rappahannock Goodwill Industries and also the AmeriCorps program manager. And I just want to thank Stafford County for having us and recognizing national service in your communities. Um, national service is a huge, huge part of, you know, some, some of the best things that are happening in our country today. And um, it's just, it's, it's nice to be, for these members to be recognized. So thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much for your service. We really do appreciate it. At this time, we will go to presentations by the public. Uh, anyone can come forward and speak on any subject they desire. You have a three-minute time limit. I ask that you state your name and address for the record. If you're under the age of 18, state your name only. When you come to the podium, you will see the green light come on, which means you're free to speak. The yellow light will come on when you have about a minute left. When the red light comes on, please wrap up your remarks. I do have one speaker card, um, Ms. Heidi Simpson. Good evening, my name is Heidi Simpson, 31 Mustard Drive, Stafford, Virginia, 22554. This past July, Stafford County placed a historical marker in front of the YMCA honoring the accomplishments of Conrad Adams, Jeff Rouse, Mark Lindsay, all of whom were Stafford's high school graduates and Olympic teammates. As the vice chair of the Stafford County Parks and Recreation Commission, I was surprised to see the Jeff Rouse Swim and Sports Center had been named without commission input or public discussion, nor had resolution R0147 been followed in the naming of the facility. That state's buildings are to be named after function or geographic location, but can be dedicated posthumously to individuals who have made a significant or distinctive contribution to the county. I propose naming the Aquatic Center after both a swimmer, Jeff Rouse, and a diver, Mark Lindsay, as the function of the Aquatic Center will focus on both sports. The Parks and Rec Commission unanimously voted in January that the venue be named to recognize both Jeff Rouse and Mark Lindsay the two Stafford High School classmates, Olympians, and gold medalists. After the Red Fine Sportsmanship Awards, we were asked to repeat the vote again. And once again, the majority wanted it named after both Mr. Lindsay and Mr. Rouse. Um, 
This would honor the um, Mr. Lindsay posthumously as R0147 stipulates. As a community, we were fortunate to have three high school classmates to rise, such to, to rise to such an extraordinary level in their respective sports. How fitting it would be to continue honoring Mr. Lindsay, who began his diving career at Stafford High School after switching from rest, wrestling, um, and both Mr. Rouse by naming the aquatics facility after them. I ask that the Stafford County Board of Supervisors publicly discuss the name of the aquatic facility reconsider and vote to amend the name of the aquatics facility at this time. I also want to um, thank you for um, mentioning um, Ms. Uh, Mann, who was laid to rest today as I work at the University of Mary Washington. I'm, I'm grateful for you um, honoring her in that way. Thank you. Thank you. Having no more speaker cards, I'll turn to my right. Anyone on the right side of the room that would like to address the board on any subject, unless it's a public hearing this evening, we ask that you wait until the public hearing. Anyone on my right? Seeing none, anyone on my left? Please step forward. Paul Waldowski. I have a new pronunciation. A Picket Lane. The last name is really Waldowski, but uh, I can't tell um, where's Waldo. I passed the water bill uh, just a little while ago and I forgot to bring mine with me. It always reminds me of uh, R82 341. As the subdivision where my condominium is, is one of 30 in the county where we get treated as a mobile home park. And of course, most of you don't know, uh, I'm taking care of that legally, so uh, we'll see what happens. I want to update you all about those 95 houses you approved by uh, Courthouse and Shelton Shop. Uh, looks like the model home's going up, and I'm sure he's going to get contracts for the other 94 houses just like Embry Mill. I want to use an analogy today that I heard in last week's um, public hearing. Walking the streets of Rock Hill, I've uh, encountered lots of different people and uh, from the school system and other aspects. And one of the neat things that came up was they said that they're four steps behind. Now, I'm a blue collar type originally and four steps to me is when I look at a staircase. And I think we all have seen a staircase because I see a staircase in my condominium because it's a public staircase. Where a staircase in a townhouse is a private staircase. A staircase in a single family home is also. Now visualize if you were walking down in your basement and you were missing four steps. Golly, it, how would you recover from that? So I'm just using the analogy of what happens when you let something go by and you miss those steps. What can I say? It was good to hear about the goodwill aspect. I support goodwill. I call goodwill the GW Boutique. It's one of the neatest places where I'm a monopoly uh, board collector, and it's pretty interesting Sometimes I just go in there and fix the Monopoly thing for someone else because I know all the pieces because I live at Park Place. You know, that's Eight Picket Lane. For those of you who don't know, my grandmother said Boardwalk was a castle with a moat. Now, I would supply the alligators, of course, but I can't afford those. It seems that we have people who are Jimmy Carter uh, are working on affordable housing, which is a great deal. And it really honors my father, who is a master carpenter with the real master carpenter. 49 more days till I turn in those 125 signatures. Thank you very much. Anyone else on my left would like to address the board? <coughs> Seeing none, I'll close the presentations, bring it back to the board. Item number 22, public hearing, fire and rescue, authorize a lease assignment for Station 9, a choir district. Chief Lockhart. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mark Lockhart, County Fire and EMS Chief. The matter before you this evening for public hearing is uh, uh, part of the acquisition of the land and the building uh, that we know is Station 9, uh, just inside the gate at Aquia Harbor. The county is in the process of completing the acquisition of that property, and the public hearing tonight is on the assignment of the lease agreement currently between the Acquire Harbor Property Owners Association and Acquire Harbor Volunteer Rescue Squad. This matter will allow us to transfer the lease between those two entities from the POA to the county where it will remain in effect. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions for Chief Lockhart? Thank you, Chief. Thank you, sir. Bring it back to the board. Mr. Uh, let's open the public hearing. Anyone who wishes to speak for or against? On my right, anyone would like to speak? On my left. Paul Waldowski, 8 Picket Lane. When I read this, I saw to inform the public that they purchased this for $195,000. There's a 20-year lease in effect right now that expires in 2020 is what I read. Um, what uh, concerns me about this is, um, like the other fire stations that are in the county, we have spanned to 14 of them, and yet we really don't have the manpower uh, to support that. I believe last um, last week there was another citizen who came up and talked about uh, the response time in that area and it was Marilyn who took care of things. So um, just want to make the public aware that um, that's where a lot of your money is going and I just want to remind them that uh, on Friday the 13th uh, the fire station in 2010 uh, behind the Stafford High School by the McDonald's was purchased for one million dollars. Thank you. Anyone else on my left would like to speak for or against? Seeing none, I bring it back to the board. Mr. Milley, the Acquired District. I move approval of R15-116. I have a motion to have a second. Second. Second by Mr. Cavalier in the discussion. Just to say that uh, in this case, uh, that, that rescue squad, Aquire Harbor Volunteer <coughs> Rescue, and with uh, help from the county supplementing uh, Engine 9, uh, doesn't need any help from Maryland. I'm, I'd be surprised if they've ever had any help from Maryland. It's just not really close to the, the issue that he's mentioning. was one on the water down in the Widewater District on the peninsula, uh, and that's one of the busiest stations. And we've been hosted by um, Aquire Harbor and, frankly, Aquire Harbor Rescue for a long time. I've been able to, been able to service all of Aquire. Uh, I mean, all of Stafford's area, uh, Garrisonville 95 area. So this is a smart move to try to upgrade those facilities. Any other discussion, Mr. Cavalier? Yeah, I just wanted to take the time to, to personally thank the Quiet Harbor Rescue Squad for their many, many years of, of dedicated service to the citizens of, the county, of Stafford County. And that will continue. We will make sure that they're accommodated in, in every way possible and that they will be you know, allowed to c continue to serve there for for many, many, many years. And um, it, it's been a long, good ride, and we want to continue. Thank you. Any other discussion? I'll echo Mr. Cavalier's uh, words. Uh, we really do appreciate the volunteers at, at all of our stations. Believe me, uh, they provide a great service to our citizens. With that said, please cast your votes. Tally the vote. Motion passes six to zero with one absent. Item number 23, planning and zoning. Authorize conveyance of assayers parcel 20A, 9A to Habitat for Humanity and consider parcel vacation to remove plat notation designating a well lot. Mr. Harvey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, board members. I'm Jeff Harvey, director of planning and zoning. We have the computer, please. As the chairman indicated, this uh, is a two-part public hearing. The first part would be to authorize the uh, county administrator to convey county-owned property to Habitat for Humanity. And the second part of the public hearing would be to adopt an ordinance to 
vacate a well lot restriction on that parcel. The property was uh, created as part of the Baird Heights subdivision. It's a little over 0.41 acres and zoned R1 suburban residential. It, the lot is currently occupied by a, a well as well as a um, tank system that was uh, originally used as part of the water utility system for that area prior to our modern infrastructure. This is the location of the proposed lot. It's on a quiet avenue near Onville Road within the Griffiths Widewater District. And as you can see from the aerial photo, it's in the middle of a residential area. Um, there are a number of houses on the adjacent properties surrounding this land. Uh, this is the notation that was on the plat. Due to the fact that it has that notation, it restricts the ability to use that property for anything other than for that well purpose. So this um, proposed vacation of that notation would allow it to be used for residential purposes based on the existing zoning. Staff recommends the board consider adoption of R14, excuse me, R15104 as well as O15-18 to effectuate the plat vacation as well as conveying the parcel. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Any questions, Mr. Harvey? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Harvey. I'll open the public hearing. Anyone that want to speak for or against? I'll look to the right side of my room. Anyone would like to speak for or against? Seeing none, I'll turn to the left. Anyone want to speak for or against? Yes, sir. Please state your name and address. Sir. My name is Tom Carlson. I live at 10 Secretariat Drive in Stafford, Virginia. I'm the Executive Director for Habitat for Humanity. We'd like to encourage the board to vote in favor of both of these uh, resolutions. I, as you know what we do, I've been here before, and, and uh, we're about affordable housing for the area, and that's what we want to continue to do. I, we have a family that's ready to go on this. We have, a, we have raised a significant amount of money to build a home on there and put a, a good family in there. It'll be a five-bedroom home. That's a rather large family, uh, but they're anxious to get started on it and, and have their own place for, the, for themselves. I, <coughs> uh, this is a, a real godsend for us. It really truly is, and we would encourage the, the board to ver vote in favor of it. So thank you very much for your thank time. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Sir. Anyone on, else on my left like to speak for or against? Paul Waldoski, A Picket Lane. I am in favor of the uh, resolution and the ordinance for this five bedroom home. I just want to clarify in the documentation, attachment three, page one of one, references Rock Hill in the Griffiths Whitewater District. That's online. I don't know how Rock Hill got put in that aspect. It says the Quantico Development Corporation subdivision. Thank you. Anyone else on my left would like to speak for or against? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing, bring it back to the board. Mr. Cavalier. I think this is a, a very worthwhile project and I'm, I'm glad that the county could turn over this land that we have that wasn't previously designated for any real use for by the public at this point and it will be put to good use by your um, agency sir and we're looking forward to working with you more in the future but I, I and at that I'd like to move for resolution R15-104 I have a second by Mr. Milde any discussion yes, yes Mr. Thomas just uh, one additional point that this is now a, a parcel of land that will generate tax revenue so it, it is a benefit to the entire community yep Anyone else? Ms. Bonke. Yes, I would just like to say that um, Habitat for Humanity, as we all know, has done a tremendous amount for the community, and um, I think it's great that we can continue to support this project. Anyone else? Seeing none, cast your votes. Tally the vote. Motion passes 6 to 0, with one absent. Mr. Cavalier. I'd like to move for ordinance 015-18. Second. I have a motion on the second and a discussion. Seeing none, cast your votes. Tally the vote. Motion carries six to zero. And Mr. Thomas is exactly right. This is a win-win for everyone. A family gets a brand new home, and this goes back on the tax rolls. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Thank, Thank you all very much. <laughs> we have got two, number 24 and 25. We are going to combine. 
So bear with me as I read these two. Number 24, Planning and Zoning, consider a request for a reclassification from the A1 Agricultural Zoning District to the R1 Suburban Residential Zoning District on Assayers Parcel 46-19. And number 25, Planning and Zoning, consider a conditional use permit for a substation in the R1 Suburban Residential Zoning District on Assayers Parcel 46-19, Falmouth District. Mr. Harvey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Both application cases are RC1515545 and CUP1400176. They are to allow for an expansion of an existing Dominion Virginia Power uh, substation on property zoned A1 Agricultural, and it's proposing to rezone the property to R1 Suburban Residential and also with the use permit to allow the substation. Um, the applicant in this case uh, is Virginia. Uh, electric and power company represented by Gloria Fry. Um, just a little bit of background the property um, first received a special exception by the Board of Zoning Appeals in 1983. Our ordinance standards have changed since that time frame. In 1983 there were no lot coverage requirements within the A1 zone. Today in the A1 zone there's a maximum of 50 percent lot coverage. In other words area that could be built on. The rest of it has to remain green. Well, that poses some problems for the uh, proposed expansion of the site. Therefore, that's why the applicant's requesting a change to R1 zoning, which has a less restrictive um, open space requirement. I'm sorry, A1 has an 80% open space requirement versus R1, which has 50%. Um, this is the uh, aerial photo of the property. It shows the surrounding uses in relation to um, the road network as well as the um, site itself. The property has frontage on Forbes Street, but it's vis visible both from Forbes Street as well as Cambridge Street in this uh, location. Nearby uses in include um, single family residences, townhomes, as well as uh, two places of worship. The um, comprehensive plan recommends the property for suburban use. The proposed R1 zoning is compatible with that. Again, suburban residential zoning category. So staff notes that it is consistent with the comprehensive plan, as well as uh, various policies within the comprehensive plan, specifically saying that our urban service area, which this property is located in, is supposed to be areas where we have adequate utility capacity to serve future growth, as well as the current residents of the county. This proposed expansion will meet a lot of the um, future needs of the nearby area for reliable electric service. Also. Um, it specifies in the plan policies that um, these types of facilities should be designed to uh, minimize electromagnetic fields. Uh, there are um, conditions here that have buffer requirements as well as statements provided by Dominion uh, um, engineers uh, saying that there will not be any adverse impact to electromagnetic fields to the nearby residences. Uh, also, by allowing expansion of this, this existing site, it precludes the need for additional substations in the area. Um, also, too, the comprehensive plan uh, has citing criteria, which recommends that uh, there be visual screening adjacent to um, these sites to help minimize impacts, and those have been addressed in the conditions, which I'll get to in, in a few minutes. Uh, this again shows the surrounding zoning pattern of the property. The property is highlighted in red. It's a, a mixed bag of zoning in this area. There's um, B2 urban commercial, R2 urban residential, A2 rural residential, A1 agricultural, as well as R1 suburban residential in a nearby area. So the proposed R1 zoning would be compatible with uh, some existing R1 zoning in, in the nearby vicinity. This is the general development plan for the project. It highlights the proposed 1,800 square foot expansion area. That expansion area would include uh, an equipment a cab <coughs> excuse me, cabinet and also breaker equipment. The, there would remain the existing entrance on Forbes Street. Uh, for the most part, the compound area itself would not be significantly altered other than this expansion. However, there will be additional landscaping provided. <coughs> These are highlighted in the dark colors are, are the areas where there'd be additional plantings that are specified in the conditions of the use permit. The, there are no, there, a number of proffers specifically that the uses would be limited to an electric substation and they would allow any accessory or auxiliary equipment and structures to be used on the property. So the, the use through proffers is very restricted basically to what's being proposed. 
Uh, the, there are a couple of conditions with this project. They also reiterate the conditions that the BZA imposed in 1983 for the site. Um, that there would be a limitation on commercial vehicles stored on property so that they wouldn't be there for more than 48 hours. So this site does not become a storage yard um, and have some negative concerns for the neighbors. Uh, any lighting that they have on site for security purposes would be limited to 35 feet in, in height and be designed to um, shine into the property and minimize bleed over impacts. Um, if the site is ever abandoned, that the applicant would restore it into um, its natural state. They, they would provide an as-built plan to the county for the um, completion of the expansion, which would also include uh, demonstrating how the uh, screening materials have been installed according to the conditions of the use permit. The um, screening materials would be provided by October 15th of, of this year. Um, Dominion has a very short time frame in which they need to make this expansion in order to keep uh, things uh, stable for the nearby community. So um, that's why we have a short time frame on uh, the planning requirement. Um, also, um, there would be no telecommunications interference caused by a substation. That was an initial condition from the BZA 1983 that's been carried forward. It, but you find that today, um, often telecommunications equipment's actually on Dominion uh, poles. Um, so technology has changed to where it's not as much of a factor as it had been in the past. Noise levels would be within OSHA standards. Hazardous materials would not be stored on the property. Um, that there would not be any um, radiation emitted from the facility. And there'd be a zoning permit required, again, to show compliance with the conditions. I get, this is another view, aerial photo view of the complex. Um, the uh, northern and western boundaries would have a double row of evergreens, which um, the northern area is, is here, and then the western boundary is here. Western area is facing towards Route 1. Um, the north is, is facing towards the end of Cambridge Street and, and, and uh, Forbes Street. Oops, sorry. Um, the southern uh, property line would be supplemented with evergreens in, in this vicinity that's highlighted. And then also in the eastern part. This was helped the streetscape view from uh, Forbes Street. Uh, with regard to the findings of both applications, we find that it's uh, consistent with the ex existing operations on site. And um, we also note that the zoning would be compatible with other zoning in the nearby area. The uh, use meets the standards of issuance for a conditional use permit based on compliance with a comprehensive plan. Also, staff believes it meets the standards of approval for a reclassification. Uh, we believe that this is a necessary um, expansion and it, um, it meets all of our county code and, and ordinance and comprehensive plan requirements. And the staff, as well as the Planning Commission, are recommending approval of both applications with the proffer submitted by the applicant, as well as the conditions in the uh, proposed resolution. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Any questions of Mr. Harvey? Ms. Bumpy. Uh Yes, Mr. Harvey. I just wanted to, um, again, just validate that we did talk to all of the um, homeowners here. Maybe this is something that the applicant can answer when Ms. it's their turn. Yes, Ms. Bomke. I understand from the applicant's representative that they had contacted all the surrounding owners. Okay. Ms. Fry can speak to that in more detail. All right. Thank any you. Other, any other, I'm sorry, Ms. Monk. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Is the applicant available? Please step forward. <coughs> She's a little injured. Okay. She, ha she broke her hip. Oh, my goodness. Sorry to hear that. Yes. Three weeks ago. Last day of vacation. <laughs> Well, at least it wasn't the first day. <laughs> it wasn't the first day, uh, but it was in Arizona. Oh. So one week turned into three. I'm sorry but to hear that. <laughs> I am doing very, very well considering good. everything. Um, if you'd please state your name and address yes. for the record, please. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name's Gloria Fry. I'm an attorney with McGuire Woods, and I'm here on behalf of Dominion Virginia Power. Uh, and also here with me are Dan Duty, who's the project manager for this site, and Nadia Yunus, who's an engineer. Um, Mr. Harvey has done such a wonderful job presenting this case. Uh, there's not much that I can add, um, but I do want to 
publicly thank Mr. Harvey and his staff and Erica Ely for all the assistance they provided us working through this because this 1983 zoning did present some challenges considering all the changes that had occurred in these past 30 years. Um, but he has given a very thorough overview of the case. Uh, we are here and ready to respond, uh, a answer any questions that you might have. And along those lines, Ms. Baumke, we did uh, initially send letters to all the adjacent landowners, and then I followed up with personal phone calls. Um, was able to talk to the representative of the Townhome Association, uh, all the adjacent residential owners, and a representative from the church as well. And um, most all of them said that they had lived in the area 10, 20, 30 years and that they never had a problem with the substation. So that was good, good to hear. Um, the church particularly appreciated the plantings that were going to be added along Forbes Street and thought that that would greatly enhance the streetscape in their view mm -hmm. into this property. Dominion has reviewed the conditions. They are in agreement with them, uh, recommended by staff. Um, it is a, a needed facility and they are under a time crunch. So we do hope that you'll follow the recommendation of the staff and the planning commission and approve both the reclassification and the conditional use permit. And we'll be glad to answer questions. Thank you, any questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much and I wish you a very speedy recovery. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. <coughs> this time we'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone on my right that would like to speak for or against the proposal? Seeing none, anyone on my left? Uh, Paul Valdovsky, 8 Pickett Lane. Uh, first of all, I believe I should get six minutes in the public hearing. These are two uh, distinct aspects. The rezoning uh, comes first and then the CUP is second. In the Planning Commission minutes, it says that this is a 4,800 square foot instead of 1,800. And those of us who know 1,800 square foot houses are three bedrooms, two full baths, open kitchen, family living room, two car garage, front and back porch. I have to talk extremely fast because I'm only allowed three minutes for a very complicated application. The background report says that this breaker equipment is going to ensure reliable, uninterrupted electrical power service from the facility. I'm sure there was no power outages last night in the storms. Most other entities that go through this are downsizing. They're not adding to the aspects. The BZA imposes things for life for a reason. The setbacks are in set for, for a reason. If you look at the summary of the positive and negative features, there are no negative features. However, when you look in the application, it does not address the electromagnetic fields that impacts nearby uses. You know, some may claim that electromagnetic fields um, have caused cancer in some aspects over long terms, sometimes over 30 years. Also, number three says that the topological constraints to meet the buffer requirements as identified in the code. Well, they don't meet them. And just because you're going to put up some kind of tree that was recommended by a planning commissioner, who's also on the BZA, they're not oak trees. They're not magnolia trees. They're not trees that are going to last hundreds of years. So um, I only have one minute to go. It's just amazing how, uh, how citizens get cut off, first of all, what used to be four minutes now to three minutes, and we combine uh, public hearings, two distinct aspects because- Let's stay on the subject, Mr. Waldas. Okay, CUPs, uh, this is the subject. I, uh, the, the CUP, obviously I hit a nerve. Thank you very much. Anyone else in the room would like to speak for or against? The applicant, you have time to respond if you care to. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there was a typo in the Planning Commission um, document that uh, the gentleman referred to where it said 4,800. It meant to say 1,800. It actually is 1,800. Um, the, um, 
if, if you'd like for me to speak to the uh, issue of the transitional buffer 35 modifications, the screening that was recommended by the staff and by the Planning Commission will actually be more effective than the TB35 that the ordinance calls for. Uh, what we will need to do is go back to the Planning Commission to get that waiver from the ordinance, but the positive there is that the screening that's being proposed and that um, Dominion is agreeing to is going to be more effective than the TB35, which is measured from the property line. The, pro the uh, landscaping that's being proposed will be uh, against the fence, which actually will screen the fence and the equipment much better and provide a streetscape that they otherwise wouldn't be provided at all. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. That said, I will close the public hearing, bring it back to the board. Ms. Bumke, uh, this is in your district, and uh, we need two um, motions, one on Ordinance 01517 or 98, whichever one you approval or denial. Ms. Bomke. Yes, I'd like to uh, uh, move for approval of Ordinance 015-17 and also the conditional use permit for R15-99. We're going to do them separately. So oh, okay. We'll 015-17 first then. Okay, do I have a second? Second by Mr. Milder. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your vote. <laughs> Tally the vote. Motion passes six to zero with one absent. Ms. Bomke. Uh, yes, and now uh, I move for approval of R15-99. I have a motion. I have a second by Ms. Sellers. Any discussion? Yes, I do have a couple comments to make. Um, uh, we did bring up with Mr. Harvey that there was a reference in the Planning Commission minutes, which are draft minutes, that there is uh, there are two references under item two and three regarding the 4,800 versus the 1,800 square feet. And also on page uh, one of the land use action uh, requested form there is a reference there to um, Herschler Fleischer instead of McGuire Woods so that would need to be changed as well since Miss Fry is with um, McGuire Woods and I would just like to state for the record that um, you know there are all these proffers that are indicated these have carried forward with the 1983 um, uh, BZA zoning uh, there's also a reference in here to the um, electromagnetic fields um, and that there will it will not be admitting red radiation um, and that the real reason for this rezoning as Mr. Harvey stated was because we couldn't meet the open space requirement so that was the only reason that we are rezoning this from an A1 to an R1 so I wanted the people in the county to understand that any thank other discussion? you thank you Ms. Bumpy any other discussion seeing none uh, please cast your votes tally the votes motion passes six to zero with one absent Thank you. Uh, item number 26, utilities authorize condemnation and exercise quick take powers to acquire permanent utility easement in connection with the Sanford Drive to Old Forge Drive waterline improvement project. Mr. Council, please. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my name is Brian Council. I'm a construction project coordinator with the Department of Utilities. Before you at this time is a request to exercise quick take powers um, to acquire an easement associated with the 342 water pressure zone improvement project. Associated with the Lake Mooney project, this pressure zone improvement project is one of three for this particular pressure zone. This portion of this, uh, this project connects a previously constructed portion that extends from the Lake Mooney project up to Sanford Drive. It'll ultimately convey water at this point in time to the Old Forge neighborhood. Um, a future phase will extend farther from Old Forge over to the uh, far southeastern part of the county. This image shows the general layout, general orientation of the overall 342 uh, pressure zone project improvements. Currently, all other easements have been acquired. Uh, the property owner for this particular property has agreed to the terms. However, the financial institution, which, which holds a lien on the property, has declined to respond to any of our requests to talk to them. Um, and the public hearing is uh, in, in intended to facilitate the quick take process. 
This image uh, shows the, the specific location where the easement is located along Sanford Drive, uh, across Sanford Drive from the Dell Webb community. And to keep the project on schedule, uh, staff recommends the approval of R1559. Any questions? Thank you, Brian. Uh, with that, I'll open the public hearing. Is anyone on my right-hand side or anyone in the room, I guess I should say, since we're dwindling down a little bit? Anyone like to speak for or against? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. This is in the Hartwood District. Um, our motion uh, proposed uh, resolution R15-59. Second. Second by Mr. Thomas. Any discussion? Cast your votes. Tally the vote. Motion passes 6 to 0. Item number 27, I will give the gavel to Ms. Sellers as I have family connections with the property owner. Hello, Mr. Rapp. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Vice Chairman and uh, members of the board. Uh, Christopher Rapp, Director of Public Works. Uh, tonight we have a public hearing on uh, one property uh, to authorize um, condemnation and exercise of quick take powers for the Treslow Road uh, reconstruction project. The uh, project was identified uh, as part of the 2008 transportation uh, bond referendum. Uh, the main goal is improvement of uh, road safety. Uh, the utility relocation has uh, begun. Uh, Dominion Power um, is out there um, relocating utilities and um, the property acquisition is almost complete. Uh, tonight's uh, a public hearing is to consider condemnation and quick take for one property, parcel 45-9. Uh, the owner of the property is uh, Nancy Bourne Samuels. Uh, from, from this property, we, uh, we need to uh, acquire right-of-way, uh, permanent easement, and temporary easement. Uh, this is an air photo um, of the uh, location of the property. And uh, this is a more detailed um, air photo showing the uh, in red the uh, right of way um, acquisition and then the uh, storm drainage easement and temporary easement. A full appraisal was performed for the property. Uh, the county's consultant, Rinker Design Associates, uh, did provide a an offer on January 7th in the amount of $25,750. Uh, they met with the uh, property owner in early February. Uh, through negotiations, the amount has increased uh, up to 40, almost $46,000. Um, and uh, some money was added for an uh, uneconomic remnant and um, some other matters such as um, providing money for a fence. Uh, the property owner um, has counter-offered at about $86,000. Um, county staff and uh, the consultant have attempted to resolve all the monetary and, and any project concerns with the property owner um, and will continue to negotiate. Um, but at this time, uh, in order to um, avoid a, a project delay, um, we do uh, recommend approval of proposed resolution R15-111. Any questions? What are their reasons for increasing it to 86000 Did they give any reasons for the counteroffer? Um, the main reason, um, they wanted basically $20,000 in, in damages. Basically, that was the reason, that the main difference. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. You're welcome. With that, uh, I'll open up the public hearing. Anybody in the chamber want to speak for or against? Well, with that, I'll close the public hearing. Bring it back to the board. Do I have a motion? This is in the Falmouth District, so I'm assuming Ms. Baumke. I'll move for uh, approval of R15-111. Second. A motion and a second by Mr. Thomas. Any discussion? that cast your vote tally the vote uh, it passes five to five <coughs> to, to zero <laughs> with one absent and one abstention 
Seeing all the business coming before the board, I declare the meeting adjourned.